Welcome to this video about ancient China. Uh, we're going to cover from the sort of mythic ancient past all the way up to the mandate of heaven. Now, again, the goal of this overview is that it is a quick overview. Look for those key vocabulary words highlighted in yellow uh, and look for the major themes and big ideas. Uh, over here, uh, you can see a depiction of a Shang dynasty village. And so keep that in mind as we go further that um, the common depictions that you've seen of Chinese culture often come from later parts of Chinese history. So be on the lookout for how it was different in this period. Now, we're first going to talk about the geography that produced uh, this Chinese civilization. You can see over here on the left-hand side, this is a topographic map. You can see that it is the uh, height of the land, the elevation uh, these different colors represent. You can see this area over here. This is the uh, plains that are in the eastern part of China. And those are where a lot of the folks in China live and where a lot of the population is concentrated in these early times. Um, it's isolated from other places because of these large mountains and the deserts that are in through here and then the seas that are over here. And so they largely develop on their own. You can see the two important rivers. There's the Yellow River or the, the Huanghe, also the Yangtze River, which is down here. On this side, you can see a map it's all about the different crops that they grew. And there's a particular line here, this dividing line in dark black. And that's because to the north of that is where you find millet and wheat primarily grown. And to the south of that is where you primarily find rice. And at first, the Chinese civilization developed up here in the millet and wheat growing areas, uh, in part because it was easier uh, to start those crops, but you needed a lot of state organization to do it. So it's likely the place that civilization first developed. That's very similar to what we saw in Mesopotamia and also uh, in Egypt, that it develops in areas where like, sure, you can grow crops, but it takes some work and some effort and some coordination. So that's really important. But later it shifts south because rice is such a good source of calories uh, when you can grow it in these really wet conditions that are down here. And the dynasties you can see are all concentrated on that dividing line, like around that space. Uh, you can see them developing over time here. We'll talk more about the timeline in a moment, but those are the major dynasties that we're gonna cover in these two videos. Uh, most of the area is covered by mountains, but these rivers allow the folks who live there to actually communicate and trade a lot easier. So civilization pops up along those rivers. Um, the East China Plain had timber, stone, and scattered deposits of other metal metals, which allowed the development of a complex civilization. And they had really, really rich soils. The Yellow River gets its name from less. That is how you say that, less. It's a rich yellow soil and it flows down and gets deposited through flooding in these areas and leads to really effective farming. Uh, but those flooding rivers need to be controlled. And so again, the power of these dynasties flows from their ability to organize all the labor necessary to do that in all these places. Timeline-wise, you can see that 500,000 years ago is the evidence of first hominids and homo sapiens show up in uh, 40,000 years ago. And then 10,000 BCE, also like 12,000 12, years ago, that's the first evidence we have of farming, which led to the Neolithic Revolution in China. Um, the Yangshao culture, uh, which is one of these really early Neolithic cultures, um, had burials of women in elite status based on the sorts of goods we find in those areas. Um, so women seem to have had some power in this early period. And then we have a, a semi-mythical period, the Xia dynasty at around 2200 BCE. There's clearly, you know, cultures getting more organized and there are larger urban centers, but really it's the Shang dynasty that we first have really good evidence from. And you can see down here, part of the reason we have evidence is because they engaged in uh, some rough burial practices, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Uh, and then you have the Zhou dynasty, which we're also gonna talk about in this video. And it really has two periods. One where it was like doing pretty good, and then one where it slowly collapses on itself as it falls apart. Now, first we're gonna talk about what writing and evidence he left behind because it helps us understand how we know what we know about this time period. From the early Neolithic periods, we primarily have pottery that tells us uh, that these kinds of people lived over here and they were different and separate from these kinds of people because their pottery was different. Uh, but what we know from the Shang dynasty comes from these oracle bones. And it's incredible. Uh, they are these bones that are either shoulder blades of oxen or um, parts of turtles. And they were used for divination, which is you know, predicting the future. But the cool thing is that what they would do is they would ask a question of their ancestors. 
and they would often write it directly on the bone. And then they would take a hot poker and drive it into a little hole on that bone and it would crack either one direction or the other. And that would then allow them to know whether the, you know, the ancestor spirit was saying that like, yes, you should, or no, you shouldn't do that thing. And then they would actually come back and write whether or not the prediction was accurate, which is incredible. So not only do we know about this time period, like what was important to them, because we know what they were asking about. People tend to ask about stuff that's important to them. Uh, then we also know what actually happened. So we kind of have a historical record. So we have the beginning of actual history, but just communicated in this really fascinating format for us to, to go back and look at the past. And you can actually see that this is the development of Chinese writing. And it pretty much just appears. It doesn't have like a formative stage. It really just is like, oh, you have Chinese writing. And it's uh, it's current, you know, a fascinating, complex self. Well, that complexity uh, came from this time period. And it meant that very few people were able to, to read and write because it was really difficult to do. Uh, during the period of the Shang and the Zhou, they were led primarily by a warrior aristocracy, especially the Shang. And that warrior aristocracy, and you can see a depiction of a guy over here, who's an aristocrat, um, they held power through military might and then maintained their social and economic power through that uh, you know, threat of violence and force. Uh, most people, the vast majority of human beings living there, were legally tied to land that they worked on, but that land was owned by the aristocrats. And also, there's clear evidence of slavery from this period um, in its own unique form, primarily war captives uh, who were then working the land. And the Chinese of this era looked at all peoples outside of their culture, which was held together by this shared language system, as what they would call barbarians, uh, people who are outside of their culture and are not as good as them in every way. Um, women in ancient China may have played important religious roles, but generally China became more patriarchal over time until eventually fathers had basically complete control over their families. They could sell their families labor. They uh, arranged marriages for their children. Um, also, in Chinese culture, there is a belief in spirits and ghosts and the importance of ancestors that develop strongly during this time period. Uh, but there's no clear like creation myth that comes out of this. It's, it's not like you would expect from, say, like other cultures we, we have looked at in the past. Instead, they had mythic emperors that they looked back to for what a ruler should do or what a, you know, a family member or father should do. And it's really the political patterns that are fascinating uh, to talk about in this particular topic. So the Shang Dynasty and the Zhou Dynasty uh, have some useful contrasts. The Shang, they begin in the Yellow River Valley. They're dominated by all those warriors who owned all the land. The king ruled this like core area directly, but generally let the rest of the land around his core area be ruled by these other aristocrats. And they took on different government roles or managed these far-flung provinces. Um, lands that were culturally different from the Shang were generally ruled by local rulers who at least like said, yeah, like you're the emperor, cool, 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 all right, all right, leave us alone. Um, and rule passed down through the brothers of the emperor. So if you had um, your younger brother would take over after you died, and then the younger brother and then the younger brother, and then would go back to your eldest son eventually, once all the brothers were dead. Uh, kings were seen as spiritual leaders, like, you know, they were part of that oracle bone ceremony, and their power came from their ability to connect to these ancestors who held all this wisdom. So things changed, though, by the end of that, because the, you know how all those, like, other warriors who kind of controlled all these other regions, like, that, that's a recipe for a problem. Uh, and eventually they started to rise up and get more uh, uncomfortable with the Shang, who took more and more money, and then also did less and less for the surrounding peoples. Or at least that's how the Zhou would tell it, because the Zhou are the folks from whom we get a lot of the story of what the Shang were like. Uh, the Zhou created this idea to justify their rule once they took over uh, through warfare with the Shang um, of the mandate of heaven. Um, so this is the idea that there's this particular god called heaven. And it's not like heaven at like a place, but heaven like a particular god um, who allowed these rulers to rule and designated who should rule, but only as long as they were good, only as long as they were uh, ruling justly. And so the Zhou said the Shang had failed to do that. And in fact, the Zhou said also the Shang originally took their power from a previous dynasty, the Xia dynasty, that had also lost the mandate of heaven. But that idea starts with the Zhou. So we don't actually have evidence of that having been true for the Shang, or even really good evidence of the Shia existing. So 
the Zhou did a lot of work to justify themselves as rulers, but they built this similarly decentralized way of ruling. Um, they did not directly rule a lot of the lands that they controlled. And they held that all together through these really elaborate and exacting rituals of who could say what kinds of things, what to call different kinds of people. Um, and in doing so, they reduced the power of the warrior aristocracy. But with all these rituals and that whole system, it led to the rise of this educated elite, the Shur, who were these like government officials, uh, highly educated in Chinese language and, and culture. And they advised all these like minor kings who were sort of losing power over time. And eventually the, Shia, the, the Shur took some power for themselves as well, and even often rose into those positions of rulership over the small areas of decentralized land. Last thing we're going to talk about is the economic patterns, and that'll connect us out to what we're going to talk about next time. So in China during this ancient time period, bronze at first was incredibly important. It's so important that the state took control of its production because it was essential for weapons and other objects that demonstrated state power. Uh, rice became more and more important over time because it could feed so many more people, and so you watch economically as the agricultural cent center shifts south. Buildings during this time period were primarily built out of pounded earth. So you'd make a foundation of earth by putting up these wooden walls and then putting a whole bunch of dirt and earth into it and then pounding it down until it was like as hard as concrete, you could build a whole building on top of it. And then what you do is you take these wooden posts and set beams on top of them, like you can see here. And then you would put uh, this sort of framework in between them and put mud on it. That's called wattle and daub. And you could build really light walls that were very sturdy uh, and you could have rather tall or large buildings enclosing a pretty large area. And that's what the kings did to, to show the power of their rule was building these large buildings and organized building projects. Uh, lots of the Chinese economy is based on internal trade for things like jade, uh, mother of pearl, hemp, and other crops. Uh, they imported ivory and other goods, so they traded with the outside world. And iron comes in and changes a lot about Chinese culture uh, in about 600 BCE. And it would begins to be used for things like weapons and stuff like that. Uh, they also, and this is important, invented the honestly weird and fascinating way of producing silk. And you can see over here, this is a silkworm. And this is a mulberry leaf, which is the only thing that they eat. And then here are these little uh, cocoons. And you take those cocoons and you unravel them. And you use that to make silk, this like beautiful fabric. And the... Chinese were the only ones, or at least tried to keep it, so that they were the only ones who knew how to do this. And we'll talk more about how that interacts with world trade next time. So next time, look forward to talking about the Han Dynasty and the classical era of Chinese history.